All right, so today we're going to do uh, a show that was actually recommended by our friend Scott. Yeah, Scott. Shout out to Scott. Shout out to Scott. So this is going to be uh, basically obscure rock masterpieces. So these are our masterpiece recordings that everybody should have. And a lot of the stuff that I picked is actually pretty accessible pretty easy to find but all of these records are records that I continuously go back to and I love them dearly and I never get sick of listening to them so who's starting um so I for this week I only have five records so if you have six maybe you should start and then I finish. have five okay but all right so I'll start I think because I think that we had you start last week so I'll start this is maybe as far as obscure records go, it's like an obvious obscure record, but this is um, probably like the first band that I got into that wasn't like something my parents were listening to, because that's most of what I listened to growing up. And this is Primus, Sailing the Seas of Cheese. This was their first record that I heard. Here's the band on the back. And uh, they are, so I'm sure, you know, a lot of, you know, record fans and music fans out there probably are very, very familiar with them. But for the people who aren't, they're kind of a, um, a very lazy description of them would be like funk metal. But there's like... Or this, funk punk. Funk punk. Yeah, yeah. They're very, like, there's a lot of punk energy. But there's also a lot of influence from like Rush. And yes, particularly in the bass playing. Um, Les Claypool is the leader of the group, and he's a ba he plays bass and he sings. And um, plays lead bass. Yeah, he basically, yeah, he plays lead bass. Um, all the all of the tunes are like bass groove oriented, um, and he's got a really interesting voice. And the um, the actual, for me, I think the lyrical content of their music is really really interesting. Um, they kind of do like Steely Dan type vignettes of like sort of seedy characters. Um, and they're, they're in, like the, the lyrics are kind of interesting almost just on their own, but the, you know, the, the, uh, the grooves are really funky. Sometimes some of the albums are more song oriented. Some of them are more like jam band kind of oriented. This one's kind of in the middle. I think it was kind of like a somewhat transitional record between their more song oriented stuff and their more jam oriented stuff. But yeah, this is, this is a, a really solid record all the way through really fun music and if you can see them live like it's it's a yeah. it's a great concert to see live Les, Les Claypool sings like a cartoon character yeah yeah he does but he's yeah. got some like he's got some serious pipes like if he had decided to be an opera singer he totally could have done it but instead yeah. he's like ha -ha, but, but he kind of comes off as like Elmer Fudd in yeah a way. Doing, yeah. doing punk with funk bass. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. Yeah. So I'm going to start with a record that uh, I have absolutely adored all of my life. I've been listening to this since I was a kid. Humble Pie, Smokin'. Smokin'. One of the greatest rock albums of all time. Have you, have you not heard this? I don't think I've heard that one, no. Oh, I th I'm God. sure I've heard their music, but I haven't heard that one. You got to hear this. Well, I feel like I feel like I'm going to get schooled on this episode. I don't. I probably don't yeah. know any of the records you're bringing. Well, you up. may recognize this guy. You know who that guy is? Who's that? Peter Frampton. Oh, okay. Yeah, I saw. Yeah. I saw him at Ravinia. Yeah. Well, he became a a megastar later, and he did. I think a couple of records, maybe a live record, and this was, right. I believe, his only studio record with the band. But. Uh, of course, the singer for the band, Steve Marriott, came out of the Small Faces. He's the voice of an Itchy Coop Park and some of the great Small Faces records. So, yeah, I mean, these guys were around. And uh, Jerry Shirley, the bass player, uh, or actually Greg Ridley was the bass player. Jerry Shirley was the drummer, and I believe he went on to play with Badfinger. Hmm. So these guys kind of, you know, they, they wove their way through the rock lineage, you know. 
And of course, the Small Faces was one of the greatest, uh, you know, British bands of the early '60s. But Humble Pie was the first really hard, heavy band that I got into. And uh, anybody who's ever heard this, I mean, you know, there's some great songs on here, but uh, 30 Days in the Hole, that's that's the one. Mm. That That's just a rock anthem, you know? So check it out. All the Humble Pie stuff is good, but it started out kind of acoustic and almost kind of country oriented at first and then kind of gradually made it they made their way into a really heavy hard rock band and i i think this is our best album mm. so humble pie smoking smoking let's see i'm gonna go with okay i'll bring this one up this is uh, a band we've talked about in our Prague episode, and I mentioned this album, but I didn't pull it out. Uh, this is Power and the Glory by Gentle Giant. Uh, Good album. It's, yeah, it, it's a really cool album. For me, it's not quite as iconic as, like, I don't know, Dark Side of the Moon or something like that, but it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a very interesting album. Musically, it's a lot more adventurous than like a lot of the other prog stuff, which is, I mean, which is saying something. Um, I remember when I first heard this in high school, like the harmonies, like they, they, they just blew my mind because they're like, I hadn't heard them before. The stuff you hear in like Weyburn's music or, you know, the Viennese stuff, but like to hear a, a rock band singing that kind of stuff was pretty, uh, it was really exciting. And I didn't know where to find that sound elsewhere. So I was kind of just like, maybe they're the only people that can do it. But I had a feeling that it was something from like the classical world. Yeah, back then, you know, the prog stuff had a tendency to be like either classically influenced or or fusion, jazz fusion influenced. Right, right. And I think these guys are one of the few bands that sort of uh, impressed me as having roots in both. Right. And um, like Renaissance type music. That was kind of their their hallmark, which you hear in a little a few other yeah. bands. But so I'm I'm making it sound a little bit like this is like kind of a scary record, but it's actually like it's a very funky record. Like the uh, the opening track, Proclamation. Um, that's when they played live a lot. Um, super super funky. Like it's funky all the way through. You're dancing, and all of a sudden these harmonies come through, and you're like, oh my god, oh my god, and then it's like funky. Um, but there's some really iconic songs. Playing the game is really good. Uh, Cogs and Cogs is kind of one of their signature things where they have all sorts of vocal parts going on, like um, not syncopated necessarily, but in counterpoint with each other. So, um, I mean, all their early stuff, I think this might have been, except for their live album, maybe one of their last really good prog albums. They kind of, they're kind of famous for having gone very commercial afterwards which everyone was kind of like, why, why are you trying to do that? Um, but yeah, this is a cool, it's a cool album cover too. It's, it's double-sided. Yeah, I think and, all of their stuff is, is sort of underrated. Yeah. I mean, they had, they had that, that uh, album Octopus too. That, that's a great album. Yeah. It's one of the greatest prog albums ever. Yeah. I wish they would have got a little more love. Yeah, well, but it's kind of cool, like, because when you meet when you meet someone who likes Gentle Giant, which is a rare occasion, but like you find someone and you find out they like Gentle Giant, like that's a cool, like bonding thing, because you're like nobody else knows who they are. Yeah. So, this uh, this album, you know, the people who are kind of really into underground rock, I would think would know about it, but you know, it's it never really got much love and it's really not very mainstream Ooh, traffic john I was thinking about that. must die yeah. yeah an absolutely awesome record one of stevie winwood's best i think yeah so very cool uh eightfold oh, wow. yeah yeah just just a just a beautiful album. I've got a bunch of different versions 
this is like the cream colored UA. And then um, this is a first pressing United Artist. And then here's a later, actually this is the European version. It's on the Blue Island label. Wow. You're a fanatic. I'm a fanatic. Well, for <laughs> stuff that I, that I like, I tend to look for a bunch of different versions just yeah. because I like to compare, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, you could, you could spend a lifetime studying this record. I mean, it truly is one of the, one of the great masterpieces and not anywhere near the, the most known record by traffic. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lil's Fuck of High Heel Boys is probably their most known. Yeah. But yeah, this one's got some, uh, obviously got some some uh, English folk roots. I mean, John Barleycorn was a, a traditional song that goes way, way back. And there's a bunch of Irish and English versions of it. Don't you guys I, play that? Yeah, Kellswater um bridge actually recorded it on their last album so yeah great album though just yeah. look and again most of the stuff i'm picking in this album in particular i mean you can find this for under 10 bucks so run out and try to find it i mean this this stuff's everywhere just phenomenal record i think that's probably one of the first vinyl records I listened to I don't know if my mom because my mom is a big Steve Winwood fan maybe she had it or maybe you had me get it really early on I don't quite remember which um, uh, let's see okay I'm going to bring up this is maybe an unusual choice but this is uh, obscure masterpieces um, this is one of my favorite albums I listen to this all the time actually um, and this is a musical called Hair, which most people probably know about. But in my experience, like most people just know about the Fifth Dimension record where they sang Aquarius and Let the Sunshine In, which are like the two kind of famous songs from it. But um, the, the musical goes a lot deeper than that. Like, like it's first of all, it was the first musical, I think, that had more than 30 songs in it. I don't know how many are on this recording. Depending on the recording, they have some have more and some have less. Probably the first rock musical or rock oriented musical. Um, and then Jesus Christ Superstar came out a, a couple years after that and was a little bit heavier. But for me, this actually holds up better. There's less stuff that's like kind of cringy on it. Uh, actually, there's pretty much no stuff that's cringy on it. Um, but there's so many classic songs like. Um, um well hair obviously is the classic one which i'm uh i really appreciate because it's just an ode to men having long hair um what do they got uh ain't got no is really good uh manchester england is is pretty famous and then like <laughs> like half of uh side two is like an acid trip <laughs> and it's just like the care so so also the plot, there's no plot to the musical, basically. Like the plot is a guy gets a draft card and he spends the whole musical trying to decide whether or not he should go off to Vietnam. But it's mostly just like vignettes of members of this uh, like flower child group. Uh, and then of course the flesh failures, which is let the sunshine in at the end. Incredible. This is the original Broadway recording, cast recording, but there's also a, an original off Broadway. There's a London cast recording. There's a lot of versions of it. And this is my mom's, actually. Um, but if you can find this, uh, this is one of the few musicals that I actually, like, get excited about. Um, so, here, check it out. So, this is one I discovered sort of after the fact. Smithereens, Green Thoughts. Mm. Great record absolute masterpiece the smithereens the first time around i kind of missed them and i sort of i don't know stumbled across this record five six years ago and man what a great rock record 
What what just, period are they from? Uh, I think this came out in the ninety. Oh, eighty eight. Okay. Nineteen eighty eight. Like yeah. Yeah, just just a phenomenal rock record. Everything that a good you know rock record should be. Great songs, great vocals, really meaty kind of loose guitar parts. And uh, again, you know, I didn't really pay any attention to these guys when they came out. Um, it was kind of, I guess I was listening to Van Halen and stuff like that and probably discovering jazz. But uh, yeah, what a great record. Hmm. So I, I don't know if there was actually any hits on this. Green Thoughts, maybe. I don't know. Only a Memory. I guess that might have been kind of a single. But, uh, yeah, look for this one. Cool. Yeah, I don't know anything about those guys. I'll have to check them out. So I had a thought for a, another episode that might be fun to do in the future, which would be um, all, like, solo outings of members of famous bands. Yeah. I thought that might be cool. Cause I, cause actually as I was going through, I'm like all of the records, most of the records that I have that are like obscure are usually from like more popular bands. And then they, they, you know, so this is one of them. This is, this is almost a stretch to call it a rock record. Cause there's, there's not even really, I don't even think he's got a drum kit on here. I think it's all percussion, but that that's kind of like the nature of rock is that it's the, the branches go out very far. Like, Simon and Garfunkel are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and they're like folk music. But so this is, um, if you probably can't read it on the screen, this is called uh, Elias of Sun Hello by John Anderson, who was the lead singer of Yes. Um, it's definitely a rock band. Um, and this was, I don't know where in the lineage of the records he put this out. Um, I think he mostly he plays his most first of the solo stuff. record. Yeah, this is his first. Yeah, and I don't know if it says. I think he played most of the instruments on here. I'm not a hundred percent certain. I don't even know if it says. But it's a it's a um, it's oh no I think he's got his band on here. But it's um, yeah it's a it's I think it's a concept record. Look at this this some of, this is some of the coolest album artwork ever it's like some like brian roger Bryan. dean is this roger dean yeah of course i don't know it looks a little bit more sure looks like it it's of the style but i but it like he mostly does landscapes and this is like he's got like a creature under this mushroom it yeah, almost looks like it looks it looks like roger dean to me yeah and well to me it almost makes me think of brian froud but i don't know if he was around at the time or if he ever did album artwork i'd have to look it up but anyway so it's that's really cool he's actually it's a booklet so he's got look at this oh he's got his band here we go but they're like mythologized in like beautiful artwork and um it's a and look at this guy i mean I, it's not doing it justice on the screen but some really beautiful artwork it's um very atmospheric um and very almost philip glass um esque which actually i think philip glass maybe i guess he was around at the time but it's uh it's not quite so song oriented it's more like textures and rhythms and patterns and things repeating and um kind of meditative and really gorgeous like he's got some beautiful synth sounds but also like a lot of organ and he plays harp um and so if you don't like his singing on the yes stuff because he's not for everybody some people like really love his singing some people don't for me i'm sometimes really in the mood for it or sometimes i'm like you know what i'm not feeling this right now if you don't like his singing you probably won't be able to sit through this record if you're like some people and you're like he's the most angelic voice on the planet then you're gonna eat this up and if you feel like that you probably already have this record and look at this so yeah john anderson i think underrated as a musician overall i would say i mean he's famous for being a yes but i think he's i think his contributions are underrated 
especially lyrically. Well, his solo records are all really good. Mm. The stuff he did with Vangelis, like short stories. That I haven't heard. Phenomenal stuff. You got to get that record. Did you hear what he did with uh, Jean-Luc Ponty? No. Oh, yeah. That was like maybe five years ago. Um, he, they went on a tour. We saw them in Madison. No, Milwaukee, I think. Um, it was cool. It was a really unlikely pairing, but it, it, it was really cool. Like everyone kind of walked out like, wow, that was, that was really something special. Yeah, he's got a cool world flavor thing out now, too. Yeah, that one's cool. It's a, that's a little overproduced for my taste, but it's cool music. Oh, he's been working on it for a long time. Like 10 years, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this one's going to surprise you, but, man, talk about rock masterpieces. The power of the power stage. I don't even know what that is. Really? Should I hide? Came out in 1985, and these are all guys that you you know. Okay. Um, John Taylor and Andy Taylor from Duran Duran. Oh, wow. Okay. Robert Palmer on vocals. And uh, Bernard Edwards produced this. I love Bernard Edwards' production. And uh, I believe he was also a bass player. Um, but, man, I just love everything he produced. He was in the band Chick with Niall Rogers. Hmm. So Niall Rogers did a lot of stuff. He produced Bowie and, yeah. you know, a bunch of other people. Um, but uh, this is one of the heaviest, most badass records, man. They do Get It On by T-Rex, and hmm. it just tears your face off. It's so good. And the production is so, like, futuristic and heavy, but still has just a tad of like a kind of a electronica thing going on even though it's just super hard and heavy mm. but yeah man when i when i feel like i need to be woke you know like a, like i'm falling asleep you know yeah. spiritually yeah i put this on turn it up to 11 and put on bang a gong and just just the intro is so good but it's just that the drums are super heavy and yeah so again you can pick this up in fact everything i'm showing today i have in my store wow and a lot of this stuff's under 10 bucks i mean you can pick this up for a mint copy for 10 bucks and it is a masterpiece truly you should put so. you should put the albums we talk about on your thing in the back behind your behind your counter you get that yeah, display maybe. you should put a sign up i mean that'll maybe get people to to view also i should have said this earlier subscribe to our channel people yes the the, uh, the syndicate's about to cut off our money supply so like you got to show them you got to show them that we're that we're and getting Gar engagement and, and garrett's mom is the only fan we have so far <laughs> they're about <laughs> to turn our power off man come on Tell people about this show. Yeah, so the Power Station, self-titled, buy cool. this record. Seriously, you you will you will love it. There's I'll nobody out, out there that won't love this record. Sweet. All right, for my last pick, uh, this is actually probably one of my favorite records of all time. I think we've had some disputes over it. I don't think you were that crazy about it. But for me, this is like, this is one of my favorite records. It's not going to surprise anybody who knows me. But um, this is The Nightfly by Donald Fagan. Hold on, I have a sticker on you. Hold on, stall them while I take this sticker off. Garrett, you got to take the stickers off your records. <laughs> this will be sped up. Well, okay, it's good enough. I'll just put my finger over it. Um, so, as most as most people probably know, there we go. As most people probably know, Donald Fagan, he's the uh, one half of the uh, of the of the Steely Dan duo, which is Donald Fagan and Walter Becker, who were the kind of two consistent members 
Um, they were the main songwriters. Um, there were a couple other players who were, I mean, obviously they started off as a band for their first <clears throat> three records, I think, three and a half. I think, uh, count, or Katie, Lo no, uh, Pretzel Logic, I think is maybe where they started to flip, but um, to end up more having studio musicians. Um, and this is interesting mainly because I was always under the impression that the kind of grouchy, sardonic, um, uh, cynical sort of elements of Steely Dan came from Donald Fagan, but they actually came from Walter Becker. And Donald Fagan is actually like kind of the more optimistic, uh, sunny kind of voice in the group, <clears throat> lyrically. Um, so this is um, a record that came out, I think, after their hiatus or when they supposedly broke up after Gaucho. Um, it's very heavily produced. It was, I think, the first record with a drum machine on it um, where they had maybe like um, Bernard Purdy or um, who was the other drummer that, that, who was the one who did the Asia solo? Um, Steve Gadd, maybe, I think, I think he played it on this too. Um, it's a lot of, lot of Steely Dan musicians on here. Uh, and they sampled his drums and like made them really quantize. But it's, it plays like a really fine line between stuff that's like really rigid and um, like almost mechanical sounding, but then there's always like, Brecker blowing over the top or Larry Carlton playing some, you know, kind of slinky lines over it. So it never feels like there's, there's always life going on in the music, which is part of why it's so appealing to me. Like it's a very um, human record. I think he actually had to get therapy after he put it out because it was so autobiographical. So for me, this is, this is the test of uh, audio fidelity here. Um, and almost every song on here is, like 10 out of 10. IGY is amazing. Green Flower Street is amazing. Ruby Baby is amazing. Maxine is like a um, like a 50s vocal, like a harmonized kind of thing, um, which is about like high school romance, but it's very like over the top and kind of schmaltzy and overly poetic. And he, and he does all the vocal parts. It's probably like four or five part harmony. And it sounds like nowadays pop singers like put their voice through like a uh, vocoder and they get like all the harmonies so that the swells and everything sound like super tight. And he did it like just with his own voice overdubbing. It's like staggering. Um, New Frontier is about a guy um, whose dad has a bunker that he built during the Cold War. And so a lot of this takes place like during the Cold War, the, the, music, the subject matter. And so he like wants to take a girl down there and pretend like the bomb has gone off and they're the last two people on earth. And so, so he's trying to like lure this girl down into his, uh, into his bunker. Uh, and then the goodbye look is like a Latin classic and walk between the raindrops is like a really kind of snappy, almost Count Basie type, uh, swing thing um i don't know i don't know how to convince people that this is like one of the coolest records ever but it, it is and you should check it out yeah i think it's probably one of the more revolutionary records as far as production goes yeah i remember you gave me a burn of it i i, I hadn't really listened to it and i went out and hunted down a really nice copy it's, yeah it's a beautiful record. It's incredible. So this is my last pick. Was that your last pick? It's my last pick, yeah. Yeah. So Montreux, self-titled. And this this really is a heavy record. Um, for anybody that doesn't know the the history, I'll give you a little history. First of all, Check out this guy right here. You know who that guy is? No. That's Sammy Hagar. Who is that? Sammy Hagar. He was like 17. Oh, wow. This is, this is his debut record. 
So this is also Ronnie Montrose's first record. Um, he had been on a lot of other people's records as a guitarist, but uh, essentially the significance of this record is it was kind of almost like the first Van Halen record. Um, came out in 1973, five years before the first Van Halen record, but it was on the same record label. Um, Don Landy was the engineer, and Ted Templeton was the producer. And that was the first time that that team worked together, who later went on to do all the Van Halen records. Hmm. Um, you can see it in the lettering and the lighting. Well, and, stuff, I, and right? I think it was maybe even recorded at Sunset Sound Recorders, where all the Van Halen uh, records were done. And get this, um, you know, Eddie was famous for having that uh, Marshall lamp that he right. tricked out. Yeah. Ronnie Montrose used the same amp on this record. Huh. So Ronnie Montrose ended up selling that amp to a guy who sold it to Eddie. So it's, it's that sound. You know, it's it's a really this is a heavy record, and it's probably some of uh, Sammy's best vocals as well. Um, Rock Candy is the 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 main song that I think people associate with this record. But again, this is something you, you can pick up for eight or ten bucks, and it's just phenomenal. No filler. Everything on this record is great, and it's. It's truly one of the great rock classics, even though it doesn't get a lot of attention these days. So, Montrose self-titled. Mm. Cool. Featuring Sammy Hager on vocals. Nice. Oh, you know what I should have gotten? Hold on, I'm gonna fast. I'm gonna fast forward. Can you wait like one second? I got one more record to get. Oh no! You're gonna come up with you're one gonna, more. You're gonna like no no. You're gonna like it. You're gonna like it. So so sit tight, everybody. All right, let me know if you, let me know if you recognize this album. Yeah, Bad Boy from Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I used to go is, see those guys play all the time in clubs. Yeah, this is like my dad is obsessed with these guys. Um, and I found so he had I think I think he had one of their records, and I think I found one at a half price books once. But so they they're still around. Yeah, I've got all the, I've got all their records at the shop. Yeah. So yeah, so my dad, like a couple years ago, like started he just started kind of like following them around. He used I think he drove them to Summerfest once. And his uh his brother, my uncle John, used to photograph rock bands or used to photograph I think them. So he's got a bunch of slides that he sent me, or I don't know what I don't know how cameras from those days work. You know, the little tiny things um a bad boy and then he also has a bunch of stevie nicks and jeff beck from when they were like double billing with them um so yeah so that so i thought i i thought i would bring it up uh this is kind of like a classic milwaukee band i actually sat in with them last summer they were like playing at a hotel and they like let me come up and sit in and play some blues with them so uh yeah they're still around yeah. uh you know so, you know, go, go check them out. But if you can find a record, like, this is a cool piece of Milwaukee history right here. Like, really balls to the wall, guitar-oriented rock and roll. 
super heavy stuff. So yeah, we've I got them all. We've we've got a really big local section. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Go go hunt them down. I just thought I thought you'd I thought you'd appreciate me bringing that up. Yeah, I've yeah. I've seen those guys dozens of times. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Well, that's that's our list for the week. Um. So as we've been mentioning. Ken has uh, quite a number of the records that we brought up today, at least all the ones he mentioned, probably a few of the ones that I mentioned. Although yeah, I think I've got all of them in stock. Yeah, so, so if someone's trying to hunt down one of the records that we talked about this week, where would they, where would they drive? What do, what do they do? They would come to Paramount Record Shop on Fridays or Saturdays, 402 East Main Street, Watertown. Yeah. Mm. We've got a serious, serious collection of stuff. It's all good stuff. No, all killer, no filler. There you go. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Like Ken, Ken tells me all the time. Like if he, if he, like he'll get a whole box and someone will bring in like thirty Herb Albert records. <laughs> he'll be like, no. Um. Yeah. yeah so. They- Make sure you guys subscribe. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. Just click a button, and then you, you know when we put stuff up. And, and, it's, uh, and it's the COVID years. I mean, you've, you've got time. You can watch bizarre, useless stuff like this, and yeah. it's not going to matter. Right. Because <laughs> you got nothing but time. Right. Yeah, so you could watch, like, 40 two-minute cat videos, or you could watch, you know, 30 minutes of, of quality content like what we're doing. Uh, it's up to you, of course. But, yeah, and, let people know. And, spread the word. And listening to records is one of the few things you can do that's safe these days. Yeah. So, you know, get your mask on, come down to the store, load up on records, and mm-hmm. stay home and drink some good beer and listen to records. Yeah. There you go. Words of wisdom. All right. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll see you next week or whenever we make our next episode, probably next week or two. Uh, See you.